All right, guys, per recommendations, today we're not talking about knives, even though I do love them, but we're gonna talk about trucks. And like I said, I asked this, or I threw a poll out on the channel, and asked if anyone would be interested in learning, you know, how uh, trucks work in Alaska, like as far as in the winter, you know, like how we winterize our vehicles as a whole. And a lot of people, they see different things like on my truck when I've stood in front of my different trucks to do videos. They're like, what's that cord dangling out in front of it? And it kind of of, uh, I've been in Alaska so much of my life, it kind of almost doesn't uh, dawn upon me to really think about these things. It takes me back. I'm like, wait, what are they talking about? But yeah. Uh, so today I thought I would do a video of how we winterize or how we get our trucks ready from the different tire set that we use driving in the serious like cold and uh, snowy environments and just in general. So first off addressing the whole cord in front of the vehicle and something that a lot of people even in the lower or southern parts of Alaska aren't that familiar with is winterizing your truck. Now winterizing some people might think is you know putting on tires or doing different things but what we primarily mean when we say winterizing a vehicle we are talking about adding different heaters to our vehicle. So that little cord dang out in front of pretty much every Alaskan's vehicle is connected to a multiple system, usually multiple system that has or has heaters, uh, like little pad heaters for different parts of the truck. So of course the most critical ones are going to be your battery and your engine or oil pan heaters. So in the cold we see, especially here in central Alaska, we see temperatures of negative 30 and colder for extended duration. So we can see weeks of negative 40, negative 50, negative 60 degree temperatures. And in those temperatures, it is so cold that your engine, or sorry, your battery cannot produce the cold cranking amperage to turn over the engine, especially in larger vehicles like this Tundra that use a 5.7 liter V8 or sometimes even larger, like 6.2 liter V8s um, and 7 7.3 liter V8s are not uncommon here. So to turn over such large engines, you need a very large cold cranking amperage. And of course, once again, in the cold, the cold causes the battery to not work as effectively. And so therefore it can cause your vehicle to not be able to crank up. So that's why you have your heater for your battery. It is essentially, once again, like a pad heater. And I'll try to show one. There's one that's pretty easily seen on my truck that uh, is over my transmission, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but essentially, they are just pad heaters that um, are all connected together that heat different parts of your vehicle. So there's your battery. Your engine block usually will have a heater as well if it's a good winterization. But for sure, the next critical one is your oil pan. So as you might think, even cold rated oils are not usually usually rated cold enough for negative 30, negative 40, negative 50. So at those temperatures, once again, the viscosity of oil changes, so it becomes thicker. And when your engine does crank up, if the oil is too thick, it does not lubricate the engine properly, or rather can't get to the engine because of course it has to flow to the engine. So it has to have a certain degree of warmth to flow properly throughout the engine. And so, Having an oil pan heater is very important at those severe cold temperatures because of oil viscosity and how it changes. Next one, of course, like I said, is your engine block. Your engine block has a great deal of different things that flow through it from coolant to oil to all kinds of other things. And so having your engine block having a heater is very important. Also too, um, another reason why you may want an engine block heater is if you drive a diesel. Diesel engines function a little bit differently. For those who know, they already know, but essentially a diesel does not have a spark plug like a gasoline engine like this truck has. And so therefore the cylinders themselves, if they're too cold, will get in the way of letting that diesel, so essentially the diesel, you know, um, compresses diesel gas to the point where it explodes or causes an ignition. So it is important for that um, cylinder to be able to be at a certain temperature to allow that explosion to happen. So once again, this is why you have glow plugs, but at certain temperatures, um, like once again, what a lot of lower 48 people do not face is that at extreme cold temperatures, those glow plugs are no longer fully sufficient to heat up the engine block as it needs to be at things like negative 50. So as a whole diesel 
engines do not run very well in the severe cold temperatures of Alaska, but this is why you'd have engine block heaters for um, a kind of plug-in system. Last one, of course, as I mentioned already, is your transmission. So a good winterization will also have a transmission pad. So once again, the transmission uses a transmission fluid and similar to the oil, as transmission fluid gets colder, the viscosity changes, it gets thicker, and it is no longer able to properly lubricate your transmission uh, or the gears within the transmission adequately. So that's why you would have at things like negative 50 and 60, you would want a transmission uh, he transmission heater um, to keep the transmission fluid uh, at a better temperature to run. So those are the ge generalized heaters. When you see that little cord in front of my vehicle that is attached to an extension cord and we use extension cords to plug into head bolt heaters. And I have those like at my house, I have those at my work. And so everywhere you go, if you're plugging in for, or if you're gonna be at a place for an extended period of time, you would plug in your vehicle. Like when I work a 12 hour shift, I would plug in my vehicle. So that way all of those systems are getting heat. So that is that plug in front. That is what it means to winterize a truck. Now, as far as tires go, tires are a little bit more arguable. And once again, if you live in more southern parts of Alaska where there is not as much cold and generally as much ice, your tires do not have to be as set up for winter. However, the reason why we run winter tires up here is once again, we hit certain temperatures where things like, so with um, Blizzak tires, for instance, Bridgestone's Blizzaks, they're made out of a compound that is more of a pure rubber. And when you have more of a pure rubber, it resists freezing as opposed to compounds of rubber. So you can even notice this um, with shoes. If you wear something like a track shoe outside in the cold, what you'll notice is that rubber um, compound, almost like an alloy, if you will, gets really hard, really brittle, and doesn't offer a lot of traction. The same could be said about tires. Um, if you have a compound that has higher durability, um, generally it has less pure rubber in it. So in the cold, those um, less pure tires get harder, they lose traction, or they don't give you the ability to actually grip the ice. So that's the first thing. The compound is different. It's more of a pure rubber and it functions better in colder temperatures. The next thing is to, of course, your tread pattern has to be more aggressive. Some people do use studded tires, but studded tires do not work very effectively. So most people no longer run studded tires here unless they're running um, like a heavy duty truck that has the weight to back it. But at that point, most people run chains and chains are kind of like the ultimate winter traction because you're seriously using steel chains that dig into the ice. However, with most vehicles like road going cars like this one, you just have more of an aggressive tread pattern. And that tread pattern doesn't so much give you great traction on ice because that's more about the compound of the tire. But what it does give you is better snow traction. So in the snow, you want to factor how well your, your tires can purge that snow that gets into them and how well they can grab the snow to give you traction. So for me, what people, I get a lot of questions like what tires do I run? I run, um, so for me, and these are rather expensive tires, so you know your mileage may vary, but I use all-terrain tires, and mine are the Nokian Rotiva all-terrains. So Nokian is a Finnish, a Finnish company, I should say, and they are known for, especially if you're in Alaska or in Finland or other, you know, uh, Scandinavian countries, they are known for their offer or they're known for their winter performance. And uh, Nokian really special specializes in cold weather uh, and ice rated kind of tires. So they are very popular in Alaska if you have the money for them. Unfortunately, Nokian's like one of the most expensive tire companies to go for, but the Rotivas work really well for me. And I do like the AT tires or all-terrain like the Rotivas because they are a nice balance of, you can run them in the summer and in, you know, like the fall, 
you can run them all year round. And so I will say, even though they are a more expensive tire, um, you do get more life out of them or you get more use out of them because you can run them in the summer, in the winter, and all year round. You just want to rotate them if you're not using specific winter rated tires. Now, once again, a really common um, strategy here is to run something like Bridgestone's Blizzax during the winter and then running uh, what I used to do was I would run like Cooper um, Discoveries. And so those would be my summer tires and they work just fine. Um, but Cooper Discoveries aren't the best in the winter. So I would run like Cooper Discoveries in the summer, uh, spring and fall. And then specifically over the winter, I would run uh, Bridgestone Blizzax. And so I used to do that with my old Tundra. But nowadays I tend to just run these Nokian Rotiva all-terrains like all year round and they just work really well for me. Once again, for correctly, they're about 200 to 250 dollars so we're talking you know to get a full vehicle equipped with them it's about a thousand dollars so once again not super cheap but to have something that you can run year around and is snow rated ice rated they perform well for me you know like in the summer and of course in the winter that's what's on the vehicle right now um, another one that i've heard but have yet to test good things about is the uh, yokohama geolanders they tend to work very well and another one that does work pretty well as far as snow goes it's not as good of an ice tire uh, but is the nitto ridge grapplers they are um, basically standard issue with tundras uh, but they do work well in the snow especially if you air them down a bit but the uh, nitto ridge grapplers are not the best on ice because their compound is a little bit more uh, it tends to freeze up and get a little bit less tacky or it's a little bit less tacky than what you would need, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So they're good for the states. They're good for snow as well. Like I said, if you're going through a lot of snow, the uh, Ridge Grapplers are really good at like purging their treads of the snow, but they're just not as good on ice. So that's where I tend to go with the uh, Nokian Rotivas um, or something like the Blizzax, uh, very hard to go wrong with as well. So anyways, those are the kind of tires and setup. As far as driving goes, um, especially here in central Alaska, our snow load is very weird. It often ebbs and flows, so you can go a month without seeing any snow and then all of a sudden have six to 12 to nine inches overnight um, and have to drive through that. So, you know, driving in the snow and ice is variable. It constantly changes, but the biggest thing I recommend for people uh, coming up here or driving in the snow is to just really take whatever vehicle, whatever setup you have and just practice, practice, practice like in large open areas where you're not going to hit anything. See what your braking distance is like. See what it takes to lock up your brakes. See what it takes to, you know, get into bad situations so you know how to avoid it in um, practice, like, you know, when you're driving down the road. So, you know, the driving here is very, um, challenging at times and i would say it's challenging more than just the ice i feel like the ice really isn't that big of a deal but once again tires and traction will vary um, but really the snow load can get you into a lot of trouble very quickly and i'm going to be doing a follow-up video talking about some of the survival essentials to have in a vehicle like this truck um, but yeah, so just driving is, you just want to be cautious. And if you are familiar with driving in lower 48, you know, like the uh, more northern states, things like Michigan, um, Maine, the kind of New England area, we have very similar uh, conditions, though up here in Fairbanks, um, but up here in central Alaska, it can vary a little bit where we get um, times of like, or our snow tends to be a little bit more dry and powdery. And that's a blessing and a curse um, because our powdery snow does not offer as much traction as um, as wet snow would because wet snow kind of packs down and can form like a hard pack whereas if you drive into um, very powdery snow it performs almost like you're driving in sand so there's really no traction your wheels will just spin and spin and spin and spin and so depending on what kind of you know snow you're in if you're in powder with a vehicle you kind of have to treat it like you're driving in sand and a lot of people aren't familiar with driving in sand uh, so you definitely want to be cautious air down tires and you know take that for what it 
So, and take your conditions as you get them. So once again, don't have a whole lot of tips and a lot of it's more experientially based, but yeah, that is kind of the basics to, you know, making sure your vehicle is ready for Alaska and kind of explaining some of the things that is unique to Alaskan vehicles. Now, like I said, I'm going to be doing a, a follow-up video after this one talking about survival essentials and what I carry in the truck for uh, winter in Alaska. All right, guys, that's all for now. God bless. I'm out.